one of the things that I love about reading Namtar, such as Sarah Kondro, is that she bridges the line between everyday this world material and affairs and her visionary experiences or nyamnang of Buddha fields. So there's this kind of often seamless travel between the world of the everyday and the world of, um, we could call it perhaps divine intervention or ex visionary experience. Um, and I personally find that deeply inspiring, the way that there's this everyday element of it that reminds us that these are real people that we're studying who lived on this earth in different times and places and had these miraculous, extraordinary experiences. So for me, the focus that you find in academia on the quotidian, on the everyday, on the mundane affairs of society, politics, governance, helps me to find a kind of relatability. Um, so the, the, the people who are subjects of Tibetan namtars are both historical figures and also extraordinary, right? They bridge that. Um, so the everyday for me, helps me to remember that the extraordinary is attainable in the human body. So for me, that's part of a kind of um, inspiration, I would say. Um, one of the things that I like about the way that Sarah Condro writes in her autobiography is that it's very everyday. The language and the meter um, of what I sent you is most of it everyday speech. It's she's not trying to be flowery. She can be flowery. It's not that she's somehow undereducated, which is often stated of female writers, even in medieval Christian contexts, so that like they didn't know Latin well enough, so they wrote or spoke in the vulgar. Um, you hear that said of someone like Sarah Condro sometimes, oh, she must have written like this because she didn't know how to write um, literary Tibetan. No, not at all. These are, these are aesthetic literary choices. If you want to see how Sarah Condro wrote more um, philosophical prose, for example, you can take a look at the translation Ngawang Zongbo did of um, Sarah Condro's commentary on Dujum Lingpa's Magom Sangye. Um, so you can get a sense of her philosophical prose in that way. So everything that we're seeing in the passage that we're looking at today um, is a choice. So I think of translation as an act of deep listening. Um, it's, it's an act that allows us to expand our world, to think of things in terms other than the ones that we inherited. Um, a good example of that is emotion words. So the way people feel as expressed in Namtar and the types of emotions that are written in Tibetan are often similar but not quite the same as the way people describe feeling in English. So um, our world is both expanded by operating in an idiom other than the one that is our mother tongue, as much as the things we take to be natural about the world become provincialized. And we realize that a version of secular modernity that um, many of us operate within is also but one choice among many uh, in terms of how to perceive the world. Questions of what is real, who is really talking to me, who is in front of me, right? That what I mean by secular modernity, to give a concrete example in Sarah Condro's writing, um, people in her community who are human, we would agree. Um, from a secular modern standpoint that those people are really there, but the Shibdak, the land, land deities, Yulha, or the Bodhisattvas, or Yishe Togyal, um, we would cast those 
in a different light as deities or divinities or um, in some cases demons, something mystical, right? But that divide between the really real and the super mundane or the divine is not the same in Sarah Condro's world. Those things don't have that same polarity. And the more that we listen to Sarah Condro in how she describes her world, the more that we understand the way we see things, not as the way things really are, but just one version of perception among many other choices and options. Um, so I also am, I find myself fascinated with the world of metaphor in Tibetan writing. Um, I think because it, it somehow builds on this divide that I keep returning to in my comments between the worldly and the super mundane or the, the everyday and, and the more dharmic language, what something is like or, or so like and as those words are something that are, are really interesting to pay attention to because in Sarah Condro's world, what something is like is very often a relation to nomadic pastoral life in Golok, right? The everyday. Um, I find those things totally fascinating. So that's something we could think about as we read together. Um, I also want to make one comment about why I suggested that we read Sarah Condro. Um, and this is really Dolma's kindness for accepting me at this time when she invited me to speak to you, I said, oh, I, I can't say, I can't do that much right now. I've, I've got this huge translation, you know, that feeling that many translators have of, I can't do anything except for the thing that I'm doing. And that's how I replied to her. And she said, okay, bring it to us. So anyway, this is what I'm really doing. And I'm sharing this with you. And that's why. Um, and what I really have in front of me are two versions of the same text. Um, actually, I have a couple other um, handwritten manuscripts too, but they're very similar. So I'm using these two. This one, right, it's from this book. Um, there was a massive project in, in Golok. This is what it looks like. Um, the um, Golok Pening Petok, something, they translate something like Golok Ancient Manuscripts Project to publish. Um, uh, the Ju Kazong, actually the same um, modern poet that I had a chance to try to hear through the static distance of Zoom on um, in Golok last night, is the was the editor in chief of this project during the time um, uh, in 2009, where when this was published. This is the very first publication of Sarah Condro's work ever. Um, which is fascinating because she's such an important figure and there's a whole whole other things we could say about that. So her work circulated in manuscript form prior to 2009. And this um, is a photocopy I shared with you. Um, this handwritten manuscript um, was owned by Chachal Sangye Dorje Rinpoche. Um, and he is the one who loaned it to me. Um, so uh, he carried these with him out of Tibet. Um, since that time, I was able to go back and see different manuscript collections of Sarah Kondo's original works in different places in Tibet. I believe that when Ju Kazong published this, he used a different original manuscript than the one that I have. So there are some differences in these texts, and the reason why I shared both versions with you is so you can see the sort of decision-making process that we go through figuring out which spelling and which reading might resonate um, the best. It's So there's a, a million decisions that have to be made um, in making choices like this. And I thought one thing that would be useful would be to think about what factors should weigh on us as we're making choices like that and what resources or methods we could use to try to figure out. 
um, how to settle on one reading or another. Um, I want to say one thing about meter before we jump in, but but first, maybe I'd like to ask if anybody has any questions, questions that might help you get into the context before we jump in. Please feel free to ask me things. I hope this can be a conversation. Uh, Maitri? Yeah, sorry, I was trying to find the unmute button. Um, this is an autobiography, correct? Yes, that's right. And so uh, when does it start? Like at what age does Sarah Condra begin telling her life story? Um, good question. It starts like many namtar or rangnam before her birth. It starts with Padmasambhava and emanating Dakinis. And it gives us the story of a particular emanation of Yeshe Tsogyal, Shiwa Dorje Tso, um, who is the, and, and Sarah Kondro is the speech incarnation of Shiwa Dorje Tso. And so she tells the story of Guru Rinpoche and Yeshe Tsogyal in a way that is very intertextual with Yeshe Tsogyal's Namtar. So if you read Lady of the Lotusborn, the opening of Lady of the Lotusborn, um, speaking of Wollstone Fletcher, uh, sounds similar to the opening of Sarah Condro's Namtar. And then she recounts after she gives a, a short account of her previous incarnations, which are all female, um, then she gives a, an account of her own childhood. Okay, thank you. Any other context questions or just comments so far? Sarah, at some point, maybe not necessarily now, but at some point, um, could you possibly say a little bit about her relationship to John and Kenzie Wampo, whether she met him or whether he was a teacher of hers or how they were connected at all, if they were? I don't think she met him. Um, and so I'll have to keep paying attention to that to see if there are um, instances in which um, she did, but in her namtar, she does not mention that. So that, that doesn't mean she didn't. It means that I don't have the right story to tell right now about that. Um, Sarah Condro was closely tied to um, the Dujum lineage. She left Lhasa. She was born in 1892. She left Lhasa in um, around the turn of the 20th century and followed um, one of Dujum Lingpa's sons, actually a couple of his sons, and their um, Chirgar, or traveling encampment. They had come to central Tibet on pilgrimage. She left um, Lhasa because her father was trying to marry her off. This is both a trope and a reality in women's lives. Um, in Tibet, uh, she was only 11 when her father arranged this marriage and she tried to put it off a couple years but could not put it off any longer. So she was about 14 when she realized she's either about to get married or she's out of there. So she meets um, Tuku Drimeoser, one of Jujum Lingpa's sons, who asks her, her, actually her older brother, if it's okay if they can set up their tents for a night on their land because they're traveling through. And she devises a way to sneak out of her house. She's a noble woman, um, wealthy, and so she describes tying clothes together and um, jumping down three uh, stories from her uh, house and her estate to get down. And, and these little details, by the way, who lived in a three or four story estate in Lhasa, right? This is where scholarship helps, right? That we know that, oh, she had to be a certain social rank to live in a place like that. Um, and so she never came home. She traveled with this community 
back to Golok. And so the sort of core central location of her life is Dartsang, which is a place in Serta, uh, outside of the town of Serta. This is in Ganze, um, Tibetan autonomous region in the northwest part of Sichuan province, as you would go there today. Um, she had a very rough life, and that is also evident in this song that she sings her friend. Um, does anybody else want to jump in with a couple questions? I can go on with a little um, specific context before we do this. Zach, you look like you're... Oh, I'm just going to pipe in for a second. I was just, uh, just for the record, I was checking the dates. I and mean, she was born in the year and Jami Kinsey Wampo passed away. And especially also considering the geographical distance, um, even if like she was a baby, I don't think they would have met just for the record. Well, that's fantastic to know, because as I was sitting here telling you, no, I don't think she met him. I was thinking to myself, oh, my gosh, what if she did? And I don't know. And I'm saying the wrong thing. So you have now settled the qualm that was going on in the back of my head. <laughs> I'm happy to help. <laughs> awesome. So uh, please feel free to jump in with other questions just as we as we go in a natural way. Um, I have a I, question. Oh, yes. Just uh, this, this t seemingly terrible husband that she got pushed off of the, seemed to try and be trying to stop her getting her, her town as a thing. What, what attitude did, did she have to him? And was he, in fact, in another sense, a great practitioner? And how do those things fit together? in her early life. Um, Charles, right? I see yes. on you. Okay, um, that's a really brilliant question. It's fascinating to think about her relationship to Gyalse. The man she calls Gyalse is um, Gara Gyalse Pema Namgyal, who was the son of a really important treasure revealer named Gara Terchen Pema Dundu Wongjuk Lingba. Um, a late 19th century treasure revealer who lived at Benok Monastery, which is outside of the county seat. If you were to go to Golok today, we're in Pema County and the main city in Pema County is called Selitang today. So just a few kilometers outside of Selitang, you'll find Banak Monastery still there on the top of a mountain. Um, so the people who she's writing about are, are very real people who lived about 100 years ago and are still remembered by um, the descendants and the family and the townspeople around Banak Monastery. Um, and it, it's, it was a fascinating part of my research about Sarah Kondro to get to go there. And when I showed up at Banak, I happened to show up at the same time as Tuku Tundu was doing a pilgrimage back to Golok and was hanging out with the man who ended up, turned out to be his first cousin, Namtru Jigme Punsok, who is not the famous Jigme Punsok of Larongar. That's a different person. Namtru Jigme Punsok um, is another famous Tertin active in Golok. And so I ended up falling into this crowd where Tukutundu spoke perfect English. <laughs> it was uh, really fortuitous. So I got to learn a lot about these people right away when I showed up. Um, Gara Gyalse is represented by Sarah Kondro. And I'm going to use kind of explicit language here. And I'm doing so intentionally because I really believe that this is in keeping with the tone of how Sarah Kondro wrote. Um, she hated him. She thought he was an awful human being and they had a great deal of contention and dispute in their marriage that led to an actual court case. Um, it was a child custody case that was argued in the Golok court system. Um, and uh, I wrote, I translated that part in an article I wrote um, called, if I remember correctly, uh, The Tibetan Art of Dialogue. And so you can see more about this court case. Uh, but she hated him and he belittled her capacity as a treasure revealer. 
And I think that those two things are in the reverse. First, she tried to enter into a positive relationship with him, but he disrespected her. And then she became upset. Um, why did she enter this relationship? Because as Sarah Kondo explains it, it was her prophecy duty to look after, to maintain Zin Kyung, to maintain and propagate the revealed treasures of Gyalse's father, the important treasure revealer who passed away right as she started to um, encounter, to, to join that community. Um, so she saw it as a religious duty to be involved with Gyalse now, your second part of your question is really insightful. Is there another way to see this, right? Um, when you ask people in Golok, which I have done, tell me about um, Kondroma. What, what is a Kondroma? What is a Dakini? Who are these people? Um, and you get people into conversation. Um, there is a kind of thing people say. I don't know if this is written down, but it's spoken about that some lamas marry women who are actually dremo or um, they're actually demonesses and they, they marry these demonesses in an effort to tame them. So the taming process, which is never done, right? That Padmasambhava initiates is, is used as a kind of explanatory mechanism for understanding the women that are closely involved in um, the mandalas of famous lamas. So they may be a dakini, like as in Yeshipe Kandroma, a, a kind of primordial wisdom dakini, or they may be a kind of unsavory figure who's being kept close in order to tame. So, so Sarah Kandro becomes understood as a dremel, as a, as a kind of demoness that Gelse is trying to keep under control. So this story about who was awful to who actually can be played in different ways. I think a hundred years later, as we're thinking about this, it's safe to say that they had a contentious marriage for many different reasons. And just like one never really knows what goes on on the inside of someone's marriage today, the same is true for back then. Um, this is relevant to our passage that we can look at um, because what has just happened is that um, Sarah Kondo has just had their firstborn child, which turns out to be a huge disappointment for everyone involved because um, Sarah Kondo thought that she was pregnant with Gara Terchen, Gelsey's father's Tuku, his incarnation, but as she expresses it and as Gelse emphasizes, she turned out to be wrong because the baby that was born was a girl and therefore um, it was a waste. And there's this huge grief that Gelse feels at this turn of events. And Sarah Kondro is tortured by this, but also the, the nuns surrounding her, one in particular, who seems to have helped with her birthing process, reminds her, hey, this is your child, you should love it, you know, and Sarah Kondro says, yes, you know, I will. Um, so there's a lot about the position of girls and women in these communities that becomes clear. Um, it's complicated. It's not, um, I don't, in short, I don't think it's a misogynist culture or it's a glorious, um, you know, let's respect all women as goddesses situation. It's, it's neither one nor the other, just like um, our, our world is filled with contradictions. So that's a little bit about Gelsen. Yes. And, and uh, she was sent to this guy by her teacher and she later became his consort. So this was this is kind of a curious twist to it, isn't it? Um, she, do you mean that she was sent to Gelse or she was sent to Dreamio? Yes, as I understood, or, or, or I, just from reading you, actually. She receives a prophecy that she should go to Gelse, and there's this tension that crops up later in her writing that is not very apparent in what we read together. 
about whether she should be Dreamy Osir's consort, who was the man she traveled with to Golok initially, or whether she should be Gyalse's consort. And there's this moment um, not too long after this passage where Gyalse, and remember this is a rangnam, this is Sarah Kondro writing Gyalse's words, but Gyalse says to Dreamy Osir, Sarah Kondro is not even prophesied to be my consort at all. I think she's yours. So mm -hmm. anyway. She was involved with both at different times. Um, okay, I think I want to say a couple of words about meter. Um, and this is something as we translate, if translation is an act of listening, then we are like people who can't carry a tune, you know? We're practically tone deaf as non-native speakers. We literally can't hear the text because what we have in front of us, um, we think we have a piece of paper and that we're looking at written words, but actually this is a song. It has a melody, it has a tune. Um, it's, it is a kind of music. How do we know this? There are little tags, we could think of them in Tibetan. Um, at the end, Sarah Kondro says, um, Che Luru Langwe, Luru Lang, Lulang. I sang this song, right? That's how she ends this passage. And um, we can also see that it has a tune by the fact that it's written in metered verse. And even though we don't know how this song sounded, um, first of all, there are different ways to approximate that. And, and one of them is to go and ask someone from Golok to recite this, you know? And it doesn't mean you're gonna hear the same tune that people close to Sarah Kondro used, but you're gonna get a little closer and your tone deafness will get a little, you know, like a little bit of sharpening will take place. Um, the other way is to think about meter as a kind of, um, not just form, but also conveying something about content. One of the books that I like to use to think about meter is written by Victoria Sujata. Have anyone familiar with this book? It's called Tibetan Songs of Realization, and it came out in 2004. It's her study and translation of a 17th century Gelukpa scholar, um, Kaldan Gyatso's Gur. But what I love about it is that she breaks down different meter, um, different forms of meter in a really easy to understand kind of way. Um, so drawing on Sujata, one can find that the majority of this lu, this song, is written in an eight-syllable, um, an eight-syllable verse that follows a certain kind of meter. And I'll read a few lines so you can hear it. Um, the first line doesn't follow the same meter, but then it goes. So now I'm on. If you're using this printed text. Um, you can use either text, but I'm on page 210, and I'm starting with um, one, two, three, four, five, six lines from the bottom of page 210. So it goes, um, can you still hear? Oh, look at that. <laughs> Organized. So if I, I guess you can't see if I, I'm, so it's uh, right to the right of the start arrow. So men, see, men ngai logu jumi lang nga molo nishu tasum yin. Do you hear it? Le one sang and de du trang mang we gen gachu pa yi dung ao tung nga tang bo pa me che du che. Right. So it goes do 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 do. This is, this is folk song meter. Um, this is everyday kind of, uh, so manglu folk song or um, lushok. These are different forms of everyday song that are not sounding like the classical Tibetan verse. It's a, it's a different kind of it's like country music or something. It's, there's something down home about this. 
in Tibetan. Um, and paying attention to the meter for beginner Tibetan students also helps because if you know that it goes da, 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 then you know that the second and the third um, syllable are probably one word, right? So you can break down things a little bit better that way. Um, there's also Lai or Amdo love songs that are written in this meter. So these are a whole set of resonances that come through the Tibetan that we pretty much can't hear at all if we think of this as written sacred text, right? Um, I think it's best to think of this as sacred text that's a part of a particular social world. Um, and that's where it gets its power, its resonance and its emotional force. Um, okay, so now I want to give you a little bit of context and I want to just jump in and start reading together. Does that sound okay? Yeah, all right. Um, so the part that happens right before this, um, she's with her friend Chotrung and they're out collecting firewood. Um, and so they're like strolling through the mountain. And if you're wondering why you'd be strolling through the mountain with your nun friend, right? She gives us an important clue. And here we are also living in reality. Um, that is, we're collecting firewood. That's women's work. That's what you do if you're trying to cook dinner is you're spending some of your time probably hauling water and some of your time making sure you have dung or some form of firewood. Um, and if you listen to Sarah Condro's vision, vision, like really extraordinary visionary experiences, a lot of them are associated with firewood because she's out in on mountainsides, sometimes by herself and sometimes with a friend. She and her friend are um, in an area called Solung Drakar. This is also in Pama County. These are sacred sites that you can still go to and people still remember these as treasure sites, um, Terne. And so they're there. And then uh, Sarah Condro says, now I'm reading on page 210. I'm on line four at the top, Dak Nyurwar. I said, um, I need to go quickly. Right, this is her friend Chotrang the nun who shows up in our song too. Don't we need to go to Drakar? Didn't, didn't you say that? Um, and you'll notice here in parentheses in the text, it says Minnam, right? So the Golok ancient manuscripts editorial process when they published this as a book in 2009. Some editor has looked at this Tibetan and thought that they should um, transpose it into literary Tibetan or into Tibetan that is a little bit less Goloki, right? So there's, as Heidi is probably smiling, thinking about this is a very, very tense issue. Um, about whether you should change a text and what Tibetan is right. I would say um, for us as non-native speakers of Tibetan, um, the safest thing is basically never to correct Tibetan because there are local idioms and there are distinctive regional spellings of Tibetan and the ability to be able to tell, okay, this is a mistake, this is wrong. That's, um, you, you really have to be careful because what is wrong to one person, because it's not the same dialect they speak, is, uh, can be very upsetting to another person. But um, the, there are also different alternative spellings in what Sarah Condro wrote. And this printed version can be really helpful in giving us clues as to what things mean. So again, as non-native speakers, um, we can benefit greatly from some of the editorial work they did. Although um, I would just say, let somebody else correct texts. Don't ever try to do that yourself. Is that fair to say? 
based on your experience. Uh, so anyway, um, she says, don't we have to go to Drakkar? Um, um, no matter how far it is, let's go. Yangdaki Tamendro Tada Gorche Solna Gase Sange Kakyun Nam Minkyang Yangchen Roma to Sang La Choye De Munakona Gase Ne Kakyun Nam Yeba Yin. Okay, so another thing you can hear in this Tibetan is that this is not literary Tibetan. This is everyday chitter chatter. It, this is how people really speak. And as Wollstone said in the previous lecture, generally people don't write how they really speak in Tibetan, much less so than in English. So she's making a choice to be, we could call folksy, right? She's she's making something sound proximate every day. So um, she's saying, um, I, I, I'm not going to go. I won't go. Now, if we take a long time, Gyalse is going to scold me. Um, otherwise, Minkyung, or what's more, Yangchen Jolma, Tupsang Nacholyo. I gave Tupsang Yangchen Jolma. This is the name of her baby who is about two years old. I left my child with Tupsang, this other disciple. Um, De Luna Kona, if Gyalse hears or understands Kona, if he hears her cry, Gyalse is going to definitely punish me. So instead of revealing a treasure, Sarah Kondro is telling Sho Chung, oh my gosh, no, let's not go. We, we can't take any more time. We really have to go. Um, so, Nini Ushin Kurni Chirongwen. We too um, hauled the firewood and came back home. Chotang nare ke payula yu du pame chejuk kibori. Da miu sata di dabu yu ngin la sen lurchuan ere sef. So Chotang says, when you, you were the happy, cherished, or beloved child of your parents when you were in your homeland, your fatherland, right? Now, you're in this faraway land, this negative faraway land. So of course you're depressed. Is it? Is it like that? Um, and this is Sarah Pondo turns to Chuching and says, "No, listen, Chuching." And this is the context for our song. Um, I, I personally am reading, I read that to you because uh, I find this totally moving and something for me, it's so relatable. Like, oh my God, I'm gonna get in trouble and my baby's gonna need me. So I'm gonna put off this thing that's close to my heart that I'm inspired to do because I can't do it right now, right? Um, you don't hear that voice very much in Tibetan, and it's sort of uh, nourishing to me to know that it's there. Um, does anybody want to start us off? Um, I'm really hoping that we can just go around in a sort of casual and relaxed way and get through. So does this end, is this a two hour session? Yes. Um, so it would be great if we could just jump right in and see how far we can go because it would be very hard for us to get to the end, but you know, just get a feel for it. And maybe I can finish off with the last few minutes at the end, um, zipping through a little. Um, would somebody like to start with Nyun Tang and do a couple of lines? Can I especially encourage all of our trainees to not be shy and just go for it because we want to hear from each one of you. Nishita, do you want to start? I'm happy to start. Great. Um, Sarah, do you want me to read the Tibetan as well? Yes, that would be great. Okay. Uh, um, just tell me how much to keep going and when to stop. Um, you could start just right there first. 
Okay, so is she trying to say that to those who I have a friendly connection with, I'm going to relate my own life story? So I think um, pretty close. The Yitun is where you're getting friendly connection. Um, so she's referring though here to one person, Chucheng, Nyuntang, Yitun Chucheng Lo. Hey, listen, my buddy, my friend, Chucheng. So there are different ways to think about Yitun, right? It means literally um, mind in accord to, to get literal about the etymology. But I think she's saying, hey, my fellow Chucheng. Um, and then I'm going to just say a couple of words before we go on because there's something complex about the next sentence that seems uh, that I'm still thinking about. So if anybody wants to give an alternate um, reading to this, you're very welcome. And this is what I mean by Tibetan being a collaborative process. Um, so it says literally, Men ngai logu jirmi lang with a sa in the, the printed texts and in the if you go back to the Pecha version, it says jirmi long without a sa long. These are two different word two different verbs. Um so jirmi long, like the Pecha says, that's a duration of time, don't have time to um express. I would take that as the better reading than the past tense of long, this long to arise as it's been written in the printed version. Why do these things come up? First of all, because these were handwritten manuscripts um, that were kept by disciples of Sarakondro over time in Ryoche and Serta and Dartsong and um, at another monastery in Gansé. And so as people recopy things over time, sometimes they, they become different. And the other thing is whenever you're working with a text that has been published in modern form, you know that it's been handled by many different people. And you know when you're looking at a handwritten manuscript that it has been handled by fewer people though and different people, right? Someone knew how to type who put this together. Um, and someone was living in a mountain hermitage in Tibet who sat down and wrote all of this. So again, um, I guess what I'm saying is in general, this is closer to the source than, yes, exactly, you just put it up, didn't you? <laughs> than um, printed material, but printed material will sometimes try to correct mistakes. And so you gotta look at both of them to figure out where you're gonna go. Um, anyway, I think it says, um, I'm getting to the first word, but the second um, word on, I don't have time to tell you my whole story. Um, okay, uh, who wants to start with Nga Molo? You'll find this is actually pretty straightforward. That's one reason why I chose it. There are a few little quirky things, but it kind of means what it says. You know, it's a, it's a folk song. I can read that. Great, Claudia. Because I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't get very far, but uh, this uh, I just um, uh, uh, co-translate. Namo lo ni sa sum yin le sang nen de duk trang mang we ken ke chul pa yin duk nye tsung. Yeah, that's a great place to start. It, it, yeah, I, I, I thought so. And... Um, she starts uh, speaking about herself. I'm a woman of 23 years, or I'm 23 years old, but I'm suffering like an 80 year old from all that joy and pain of karma, of good and bad, of good and bad karma. Um, yeah, that's like that's, kind of. Yeah, that's pretty mm -hmm. much how I would read it. I, I think I would say it maybe like. I think there's a comparison here. So in my own words, this is not a translation. This is a gloss. I think yeah. it says, I'm only 23 and I've experienced all of these joys and sorrows as much as an 80 year old would have. Yeah. So to position uh -huh. that more yeah. as a translation. I, yeah, um, I put 
Uh, yeah, I oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh no, please go ahead. No, I I, I feel I felt like that. Or yeah, I because I I inserted a but. I mean, I'm I'm 23, but I'm suffering like an 80 year old. And I mean, I would know how far you want to go. Um, uh, to like you said, it uh, sounds much nicer to say that more explicitly. I think that where we can say that is the word, um, here we have this This means like the multitude of, is an enumerating word, um, mm -hmm. the amount of, or the, the multitude of um, positive and negative karma, happiness and suffering um, mm -hmm. I've experienced is equal to, Mm. that of an 80 year old mm. is equal to the suffering of an 80 year old um, there's another question that comes up here with ages that I think about too um, clearly it says I'm 23 uh, Sarah Condra was very explicitly detailed about age and date and this is something that different Tibetan writers have a different degree of accuracy regarding time. Some texts are a little bit loosey-goosey with time. I'm sure they knew the time, but they, they don't always write it in clear ways. Um, other texts are highly detailed with time, and I suspect that has to do with the journal writing practices of the, the writer. Um, Sarah Kondro is so precise with time, with I was this old, this number of years old, it was this year, and every time there's a time particle in her text, I, I've gone and noted that and noted the year and compared it across different works that she wrote. She never makes a mistake. So I suspect that she journaled through her life and that she had notes about what happened when. Um, for the kind of consistency that you get. So the, the question about 23, it clearly says 23. If you do that in terms of what year it was, she was 22, right? Because Tibetans count time from conception and we tend to count age from birth. So that raises a question as a translator about whether you want to enumerate that according to age by birth, which will be the assumption of most of your readers. So there's that that I leave you with. Um, it's complicated because you might say, oh, okay, let's call it 22 then, um, because that's a translation of age as well as, that's the meaning, right? Is that she's 22. But then she says like an 80 year old and you kind of want to leave that because it's a round number. She didn't say like a 79 year old. It's not meant to be precise, like 79 and a quarter or something. It's meant to be like, I'm like an 80 year old. You know, I have gone through so much in this short life that I've had. So there are dilemmas with how to translate age. Okay, um, this, song follows a beginning, middle, and end structure. So this is this ngatango. So first, blah, 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 blah. Who wants to start in with what happens first? I, I can go next. Okay, great. Uh, can I ask you something before, like about something that you mentioned? Um, so in a, in a previous, in the previous sentence, there is a children law, right? Yes. Uh, what, what is the law doing there? Because I couldn't, I, I didn't know if the law goes together with the men, but I mean, it didn't make much oh. sense. I mean, there are some times where um, with verse, verse can be pretty loose, right? And not so many grammatical particles. And sometimes you do have to read across lines, but mm -hmm. here I wouldn't, um, here I see the law as something that goes along with the name. It's a kind of familiar, Shijang lo. Um, it's also, though, a meter filler. So why didn't she just say chocheng? Because she, uh, often people add a syllable here or there to keep their meter stable. So um, there are times where you'll see an extra syllable that doesn't necessarily communicate meaning. But I think it's a kind of, um, in terms of meaning after a name, it's a kind of diminutive 
um, like a friendly sort of sounding thing. Um, low can also be a um, terminating particle. So it's not always that, but for it to be a terminating particle, it would come after a verb, not after mm -hmm. a name. So that's, that's my reading of it. Does anybody want to add more to that from their experience? Heidi? Sarah, I can say something about that. Um, my Tibetan teacher at Dar in Darjeeling was a, a Lhasa aristocrat, and he used to get a big kick out of me imitating his, uh, his use of lo, because he would say that in Lhasa, people call each other by saying, ula, and then the, the respondent would say, lo. Um, it was almost like a like sort of, hey, hey you, yeah, yeah, kind of thing. So it could have been like, listen up, a, a follow up if you're listen, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is casual, right? And so mm -hmm. your translation should be casual in whatever way you, you wanna render that. Um, hey, buddy, chuchang, you know, that's what this says. Right. Uh, okay, do you want to do the yeah. next part? Yeah, so, um, so okay. Nadam pame chuchunche, sekar sum narsum chuki su. You can stop there if, yeah, okay. Uh, so should I finish there? Uh, should I stop there? Uh, to begin with, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I say something like. Um, at the beginning, I was uh, cherished by my parents, and I was uh, uh, I was nourished with the three Y. Um, one second, I cannot find my translation. The um, okay, the three Y uh, foods and the three sweet things. Absolutely. Um, I don't know. Do you want to do a few more? Yeah, Not sure. that I'm trying to pick on you or anything. <laughs> no, no. I, I didn't know if someone else wants to go. I, I, I don't mind. Yeah. Um, Lutra Dag Goma Tadanyam. So um, um, the Lutra Dang, um, I, I found in the dictionary, it says like radiant complexion. So I say something like, um, so, um, like I was of um, radiant complexion, equally um, or like a deity, something like that. It's a very rough translation. I didn't have the time to to put it in better words, but it's a, she's a kind of a, equating herself to um, the body of a deity or something like that. Yeah, that's right. So. First, I was the beloved child of my parents, nurtured by the three white and sweet foods, right? Curd, milk, and butter, um, sugar, honey, and molasses. Nothing bad about any of them. Um, my body was as radiant as that of the gods of the upper realm, maybe something like that. Okay. Um, okay, does somebody want to take over from there? Uh, I can read a couple lines if Great. that's okay. Wonderful. Um, I'll, uh, I want to preface it with saying that uh, because this was uh, pitched to us as a folk song, I uh, got kind of experimental and reworked the meter to uh, music that I was listening to, so it might be really bad. So if it's really bad, we can just correct it now. So my complexion, uh, Gonzalo left off with my complexion shown like those of the higher gods. Um, me open mine. Che. Me kungi chung mar topsha che, nor long chu du me nyinkur che. That's a good place to stop right there. Okay, I translated this as 
adorned with plenty of jewelry and precious silken clothes, my suitors drooled over me like a choice portion of meat and courted me with many gifts and wealth. That's great. I love the, I love the cadence to that. And you raise a good point, which is, um, which I think Wollstone also underscored, both the difficulty of translating something that's metered verse and also the challenge, a great translation will sound good in, its, in English, right? And won't sound like Tibet glish. Um, and mm. I think you accomplished that. Uh, it sounds flowing and the, the heart of the meaning is there. Um, uh, there's one word, topsha, which is so interesting because yeah. I just love Tibetan etymologies, right? Like the portion of meat, literally, and you put that in, in a kind of literal way. It also, to topsha che, it means to, to have a contest, right? So now oh, you can yeah. imagine people, uh, literally arguing over which portion of meat they're gonna get. Um, there's that etymology here, mm -hmm. but um, you don't have to necessarily go that literal because arguing over meat in English sounds maybe a little stranger than it does in Tibetan. And so um, another way to say that was um, everyone competed to win me as their bride, right? You, you could go there, but I see how you gave it a nice spin um, by going literal in the way that you did it. Okay. I mean, I've also heard people, um, I mean, I, I have sort of been reading this as at least the context you gave us as a very misogynistic environment. So treating a woman as a piece of meat seemed to me to be relevant, which is why I made that choice. Yeah, you're not you're not wrong. Um, Sarah Conjo's father negotiated with other people, uh, exchanging large amounts of wealth, and uh, was preparing to um, exchange her off. Right, so he gets rich and gives her away. That's that's the situation she was in in Lhasa. Um, and then later in her life, Gyalse certainly didn't respect her very much and is uh, is going to trade her off back to Dreamyosa. So this happened to her routinely, not just not just in one situation. Um, again, like this, this is what requires really careful listening. So we're definitely in a situation where she does not have complete autonomy. How we judge that, I think, is where we need to be careful because remember that she just wrote us 632 folios of Tibetan about her life. She's controlling the shots here. She's telling us her story in the way she wants you to hear it. So there is agency here as well. So that's what makes it complex. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's a good reading. Um, so they give her lots of, they give lots of gifts, nor long chu dumi nyen kur che. Nor, of course, is a really um, rich word too, because nor can mean two things. One is wealth and the other one is livestock. Like in Golok, when people talk about the nor, they're usually talking about the herds outside of the tent. Um, and of course, this double meaning is, is fully intentional because the household wealth is the livestock, but that, um, that, that sort of has a kind of deep meaning when you think about it in it, both of its meanings. Here, I think it means wealth, um, or I would choose that word in English. Okay, who wants to take over with Nye Pama Jordan? I'll, I'll go, Sarah. Awesome. Nye uh, Pama Jordan Wang Sin Pei Sin Nang Wa Tushin Chuman Jin. You could stop there. Um, 
So because of um, because of the power and wealth of my parents, oh, sorry. Yeah, because of the power and wealth of my parents, um, the lofty realms of thoughts about Dharma, I did not consider. Yeah. I like your poetic tone there as well, right? That in everyday speech, we would not say consider at the end like that. Um, so it gives it a little feeling of some kind of poetry to leave the the trend, the consider at the end of the English. Um, yeah, that's what it means. I, I wrote something like, since my parents were wealthy and powerful, I was haughty and did not recollect the Dharma, mm -hmm. right? When you, when you live too well, you know, like in the God realm, you don't ponder impermanence. You think it won't happen to you. Um, okay, Nga Bardu. Now we're starting to um, the middle of her story. Another thing, I, I chose this passage for you because it has this sort of clear beginning, middle, end kind of structure. Zach? Oh, can I just ask about, I'm not so familiar with this expression, Nangwa To. Is that something you've seen before or seen in her, her writings in particular? Or can you just spell that out a little bit more, how you? Sure. Um, Nangwa has a lot of meanings. One is, um, it, it has to, it's a word that has to do with perception, right? Um, and to means high. So like I was, so I chose haughty because it's that kind of like, I'm like, I'm looking down, literally, like I'm, I'm on high looking down at you measly people, right? It has a, there's a, um, like a physical height here in the word to. Um, and so we, we say that in English, like, don't be so high-minded, you, you might be able to say. So it means arrogant. I'm looking down on, like to tong chung che in Tibetan is another spatial way of describing um, the attitude of um, like, Tong Chung Che is literally to look down on. And you can say that in English too, of course, to look down on someone. So um, distance is being used to describe a kind of attitude. Does anybody else want to add something to that in terms of how they understand that? So Hadi what I chose is arrogant, right? You could try to keep the the high, high-minded, or I don't know. You know, there are lots of choices for that. Shall we go forth, or Zach? Did you want to comment further? No, no, that's the, uh, that's great. Thank you. I'll think about it a little bit more. It's just an interesting idea for me. Sem sem namo. Anybody else want to move on? Uh, Shay. Yeah, I can. Okay. Uh, how many lines should I do? Just two. Uh, to the tong. Two. Two. Nga paradu kunjo tuji yi ne rang yul simbol lindu tong. This one, yeah? Yes, thank you. Okay. So in the middle uh, through the compassion of the three jewels i saw my own region and dwelling place as the land of the rakshasas exactly yeah so her perception is starting to change so this song gives us um another reason i like it is it's this folksy down home tone of describing what it means to renounce right? The path of living a dharmic life in short, spoken in an easy to understand way. So now we see the, the turning of her mind. Um, would you like to do a couple more along the same line or shall we pass the mic? Shay, you can decide. Um. Uh, I suppose, yeah, I could. I, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's quite, quite uh, I think, clear these, these 
particular lines. So then you have, um, uh, all right, okay, so ma nyedel korwe chakdo she lu zeba tukni shiru ko. And maybe one more, and then it ends this sort of, can you ah. do one more too? Yep, okay, so no longe yeah. dikbe sabun tong. Yep. Uh, okay, so um, my my mother and near ones I perceive to be shackled in samsara's chains. My beautiful body I understood to be a basis for the five poisons. Uh, wealth and enjoyments I saw to be the seed of negative actions. Exactly. So these things that coddled her before are now emblematic of samsara, right? As she is generating the attitude of renunciation. Um, so ma nyindro korwe chatrokshe, I understood or I knew that mother and relatives, not that they were shackled, but that they were the shackles of samsara, right? Nice. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's a positive. You are that. Um, I understood my beautiful body as the basis or the foundation of the five poisons. Nor I saw wealth as the seeds of sin. And I think here may be the alliteration that is allowable in English there with seeds and sin kind of lends itself. Um, Dikpa, right? Of course, it can be negative actions or sometimes it can be evil. Um, as Wollstone was saying in that previous lecture, um, here it becomes difficult to find language that is not heavily implicated in Christian conceptions of theology. People feel different ways about that. There are certain words that I would avoid in, in translation. For example, J or J de mi is the way Sarah Kondro always refers to her master, to her guru. You can say the Lord all the time, but then you sound like the Bible. So I would translate that, I intentionally translate that as the master in order to avoid the Christian, the heavy Christian vibes. So there are some instances where I do shy away from language that I think is most hearable to the Anglophone world as Christian. But when you're talking about evil, it's pretty hard to find a word that doesn't have something to do with Christianity. So anyway, the seeds of sin. Sounds good to me. Anyone want to make a comment here or who would like to forge on ahead? I can go next. Great. Ne nge me dream pe loke ne sana po kang pe kang we drogi che. Should I go on or? Um, this. Can you do one more? Drain carpo go yi sha shen kyun. So the wish um, to wander to uncertain places arose in me. Um, and I walked by foot uh, to dark lands or places. Um, and wore, um, wore the clouds, wore as a hat and um, the clouds, or I wore the clouds similar to a hat. Yes, exactly. So now we have this play of light and dark emerging in the Tibetan, and we can think about how to represent that in English. Um, so there's also, um, a paradigmatic expression here, ne nge me drimba, right? This is the way it's often said, spoken in Namtar, um, to wander in uncertain lands. Nge me has many meanings. It can, you could gloss that as strange, unknown, 
foreign even because it means that you don't stay in your homeland where you're filled with attachments of people that you um, that are near and dear to you. Like it was described before as ma nienja, right? My mother and my relatives. You leave all that behind as the shackles of samsara and you forge on ahead in places that are that are unfamiliar to you in which you are a stranger. So this is both a kind of call to renunciation, um, to cutting your attachments to those near and dear as much as it is something that Sarah Condro actually really did. So it's profound in her writing because many people hold this as an ideal, but not many people leave their homeland and walk for eight months to a completely foreign territory where you don't speak the language. And by foreign, I mean that Golok was not incorporated into the Ganden Potrong, so she was leaving Tibet and going to a place that was an independent kingdom, Golok. And she was a foreigner known for the rest of her life in Golok as Uza Kondro, which means the, the Dakini lady of central Tibet. And that can also, that name gives you a sense that she was never a local. You know, she may have learned how to write and speak with a Golok idiom, as we hear in this text, but she took that call to Ngeme Drimpa, to wander in uncertain lands, as an actual path to really live. So uh, it's a paradigm and a reality in her writing. Um, and I like how you phrased the rest of it. I, I put this as the urge to wander in unknown lands arose and my feet stepped out onto the black earth. I wore white clouds over my head like a hat. And surely you could be even more poetic than that, but that's a meaning translation at least. Um, Zach? Oh, I, this is a very interesting expression, the black earth to me, the San Nakba. What, what do you think she means by that exactly? Also, is that a phrase that you've seen elsewhere? Or what, what, is, what does that evoke to you? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So um, colors are totally meaningful in Tibetan as um, they have metaphoric resonances. Black and white in Tibetan, now we're talking about um, what we might call in academic circles as a discourse on virtue. And to, so, so black, and, and if we wanna also think about the critical race theory that is being talked about a lot right now in light of, um, at least in the US, in light of the police killings that keep happening and the Black Lives Matter movement, this is very much on the tip of everybody's tongue talking about race and blackness and how we use these words. So this is actually a terrain that I think more work needs to be done on and it's, it's people have to be pretty careful about it because in Tibetan, blackness means non-virtue. It, it means negativity. So I read that Sa Napo, not as a paradigmatic expression like the Yeme Dumba, but as a kind of foreshadowing of and description that she went into great detail elsewhere about how difficult this path was. She nearly starved to death on the road um, and she nearly froze. I take that to be not the language of metaphor, but reality with how difficult her travel was. And um, so she's remembering her feet on the earth as being something like a, a negative, like a gauntlet. She walked the gauntlet. There's something rough meaning that is meant here. Zach? So out of curiosity, in contrast with the chin, uh, the chin carpo, she at the same time she's wearing this hat of white clouds that signifies somehow that her virtuous intention is in the right place while she is wandering the dark earth. Is that how you're reading the, the contrast there? Or exactly. Her head is in the right place, so to speak, even while she is in these dark lands or yes, exactly. <laughs> the color here to be saying in my own words of a glass, um, the road was full of danger and negativity and difficulty, but 
I, um, but my head was under the whiteness. I was focused on virtue and, and um, on the path to go to this land where I would encounter the great perfection Dzogchen teachings. And also the spatial dimensions of this allow this reading because what is lower is the earth and what is higher is the sky. So all of this is, is readable as a commentary that is tied to virtue. There's one more, um, there's one more uh, black coming up. Um, could I, uh, wait, oh, Martina, you were the last speaker. Would you mind doing one more line so we can continue our colors with yeah. your leadership? Yeah. Sure. Um, they long chu uh, chu and not long Latin. Um, so this is like uh, I depended on um, the Black River, I think, for uh, food and um, wealth and I guess sustenance. Yeah, so. That's right. And here there's a reference. Um, we can understand a little bit about what she means by reading the longer Namtar um, in that she describes in really um, exquisite detail the experience of nearly starving. Um, and I think that she's referring to it here. So relying on so here's the question. In English, we may want to keep the colors so that we're conveying to our reader that there's a parallelism through the lines. So we could choose to say relying on black water and wind as food and provisions. So starving, she's, she's eating the air, kind of. Um, mm -hmm. Now, black water, what does that mean? Um, I, I guess what that means is dirty water, and she does describe gagging on food that's dirty because she's never had to eat that way before because she's a noble woman who had servants. Um, so we could take that more or less literally. Does anybody want to give a different um, idea or reading? I just, um, it uh, struck me now that in the first place, she was saying that she was fed uh, with and nurtured with the white foods and now she's, um, she relies on the black ones. I think because I feel like um, this is kind of the stylistic device and the tension in this whole text might be like this play of opposition, black and white and how it was before and how it's then and that the wealth is now the a seed of the sin and so on and so I think that's a nice kind of play to see this uh, pattern of opposition like in the broader context and then you have the black um, food and drink she has to rely on as opposed to the white one she was pampered with as a child. Um, Claudia that's an excellent observation um, and I think that that is exactly right. We're meant to see the contrast. She's making it really clear, right? She's not trying to be overly ornate here. She's, she's trying to really communicate how different life was by using these colors. Um, okay, so we have another parallel metaphor. Okay, Zach? <laughs> so many questions. Um, is there, when she's saying Lungla Ten here, is there some kind of like yogic Chulen implication with that? Or is it, is it really, you're reading more just like, oh, I was so poor, I didn't have anything to eat. I was just breathing air. Uh, so, um, there are heavy Tsalung references in this text. So um, there are extensive engagements with Lung in that way. Um, here, I tend to read it in a more, um, I was starving. I, I'm reading it here a little more literally. So um, I, I just feel that that's the tone of this, but, but the, that word, you're right, is multivalent and is picked up in Salung discourse pervasively. Yeah, I just, there's something very, um, for me, interestingly slippery in the language that she's using here because, um, maybe because in the previous verse she was saying, I, I wore the white cap of the cloud. So 
there's just something going on. It, it, it seems to me that like she was there, but she was already in an, some kind of an elevated state of mind. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 I tend to read it like you that probably it's just that like she's starving. Um, but it is interesting that that implication could be read there also somehow. That's right. And I think the best translation would reserve that two-toned possibility in English so that your reader, as Wolston was saying, our reader may surpass us in comprehension, right? So that we could provide that reading to the reader would be ideal. Um, okay, so just I was just- Really quick question. Would, uh, do you think stagnant water would work to, as a rendition of Chunak? I do. I also think what she really, if I were to try to say in my own words what I think she really means, I think she means she's drinking from the river. And the river has all sorts of sediment in it. And so the water is literally grayish. It's not clear. Um, and so we could call it dirty water, stagnant water, but if we do, we lose the color parallelism unless we choose the same word for knock elsewhere. So that's where I was thinking of trying to preserve the colors. But these are, that this is not a question of something being more right. Now we're talking about a tone and style. Okay, um, that makes sense. Okay, so who wants to start with Lu Dratong, right? This is parallel to what happened in the beginning as well, except now the color is different. I can continue. Okay, wonderful. Thanks, Julie. Lu Dung Ro Lang Tel Dok Ta Gur Selbu Nikok Ruru Kun. Um, I wrote, my complexion was as ashen as a resurrected corpse. I wore a ragged robe, not hindering the cold. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so the um, Lu Dratang, right? We have that before. Rolang, Rolang is a zombie, right? There's a whole genre of Tibetan storytelling about Rolang. Um, and Taldok is the color of ash. Um, so yeah, uh, like because she's not eating well, right? And this is the precursor to this expression earlier as well, that she ate so well that she was this, had this radiant, beautiful body. Now she's eating, um, poor quality food and my body's radiance turned ash colored like a zombie. Um, and then um, this one also is something to note that the manuscript and the published book spell um, this differently. So we have a, a host of possible readings um, available to us. The meaning of the phrase though is, is clear. I think that in one way or another, it means I wore thin tattered clothes that didn't cover me. I kind of wonder if Mikok is a variant spelling of um, like the first kakanarokokakok, which Mikok means uncovered, which tends to fit kind of well here, so that would be another potential homonym reading. Um, Shay, did you want to jump in? Um, yeah, I just, just wanted to mention as well, I think kok is uh, the imperative, it is the good sick of uh, like gak, like to block or stop something. I, I, I was wondering if, if maybe they, she was just using the imperative for some strange reason that uh, Mm. Here, I think no, because I think the imperative would have to be at the end of the line. Um, I think we're in the realm of adjectival usage. Um, so, okay, uh, Julie, could I ask you to do one more line because then we end? Um, do you want to? Sure. Um... 
Ni kun gi dangmo demo ser. Declare the derelict a divinus by all. Yeah, that's lovely in its poetic form. Everyone called me a um, demoness beggar girl or something like that, vagabond girl. We have to save somehow the female particles in the Tibetan, right? She's not just a vagabond um, or a bum. She's a drongmo, a female um, beggar, and a dremo, as I was talking about before with this idea that the women close to lamas, they're either kondroma or they're dremo, right? So, I don't know, like Machiavelli said, like you keep your enemies close to you, you know? I see that as like the lamas, they marry the bad ones. They keep them close inside the circle to prevent them from more harm. There is a little bit of that, like, and, and this is a commentary on gender as much as it is a commentary on different conceptions of um, beings, de deities, right? So uh, she's really trying, but she's not accepted by the community. She's a foreigner, she's an outsider. She's illiterate as a young person. She has no formal education. Her father is not a Golok lineage holder. She's an outsider. And that's very clear in her writing. And you see this sort of gradual progression that is hard won over the course of her life. She's not a Tuku. As much as her Namtar begins, as Maitri asked me, her Namtar begins with her being the speech incarnation of Shiva Dorje. So I think that takes quite a while for her to realize and experience in this present lifetime. Um, so who wants to go next? Sarah, if I might jump in, um, we have 15 minutes left, mm -hmm. and I wonder if you're hoping to get through the whole text, this might be a good place, since I think all of our students have read now, to, 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 to just go and go through the rest of the text your, yourself, or if, you, if you're not concerned about finishing the text, then, then by all means, we can just continue. Okay, so I'll give you the choice. Here's what I was thinking of doing, um, going uh, gradually, and then in about five or 10 minutes stopping. And I was thinking of powering through the final third of the text where she says at the end, I was thinking of just bulldozing through that myself and giving you an end reading of that. Um, maybe in like five minutes, I could start the bulldoze. Does that sound good to you? Or would you like to do a few more before I? So that means we'll leave out a couple lines in the middle, but. You're getting the gist. Sound okay? Does somebody want to try their hand at um, Chok Nyesa? If they're going around, I can go next. Great. Okay. Um, Chok Nyesa Duk Tu Meter Shing Sa Lag Gang Tung Lag Gyang Nejin. Okay, that's a good stopping point. Okay, so um, when they're close to me, they don't offer me anything and they give me the leftover foods and drinks from a distance. That's right. So dukdumiter means um, it's more common in Golok to say it this way. They didn't let me um, stay near. So... Um, it would, it would say something like, they would not allow me to go near them and they only gave me their surplus food and drink from afar. Remember, she's a sort of demoness foreign other. And she compares herself elsewhere at this time to um, being like a contagious disease. You get too close, you're gonna get like infected. So I would say this text is very, at least I read it as very emotional. It's very poignant, right? When you compare yourself to a contagious disease in terms of how you felt that you were treated at that time, 
you get a it's strong you know Lee they die Jung young anyone want to try I'm gonna start calling on people like a mean professor. <laughs> Should I do that? Uh, I I can I can uh, do it. Okay. Thanks. Uh, the the okay so so okay so let let it out. Chung Yang Mingru Che Lo Hak Sam Pak Pei Che Lam Nyek. So it's something like like um, okay so but they wouldn't offer the food and drink from afar yet. Despite such behavior, I persevered uh, and uh, pursuant of the path of Dharma with pure and sincere intent. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Although I would read the, the first part, Le De Dar Jungyang, right? You mm. read it as the behavior that had befallen her. She takes that on as um, her karma, right? So she doesn't oh, yeah. the other people for treating her badly. It's um, even though karma like this befell me um yeah that's logical yeah yeah thanks yeah um i persevered my intention was focused solely on following the path of holy dharma um all right we'll just do a couple more lines anybody shay do you want to continue with two and then or if somebody else wants to yeah unless someone wants to step in then I kind of like these next two lines, um, if I can take them, if that's okay with everyone. Absolutely. Um, so, Lei De Ter Jung Yang Ying Ru Che and persevered. Uh, oh, sorry, no, wrong place. Yul Satak Ring Wang Al Dup Che Gun Chang La Nge Pe Gulu Ki Che Min Pe Shapak Chubur Song. Should I keep going or stop there? Uh, you can stop there. Okay. So, um, so walk the Dharma with a pure and altruistic mind, yet the dirt journey to such distant lands exhausts me. The frigid winter squalls blowing on my head and body blistered every piece of flesh besides my tongue. And yeah. one of the reasons I like this is because it seems to sort of be conflating her literal travels and distance lands with uh, walking the path of Dharma and both of them having great hardship. Um, absolutely. That's true. The thing I like about it is the specificity of it all over my body except my tongue, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's a detail, right, that implies, again, some kind of proximity. It's a writing that makes you think, oh, she really meant all over her body, like from head to toe. Um, and that happens, right, wind chill uh, or like partial hypothermia. The, what the body does is it, it, you get these cold blisters and as they heal, they itch. So she's completely covered in blisters because she doesn't have the proper clothing to withstand the temperatures of travel in Tibet in the winter. And she also doesn't have adequate food to keep her warm. So she's really, really suffering. Um, so I had something like in the winter, strong icy wind caused the flesh on my entire head and body, except for my tongue to erupt in blisters that oozed both blood and pus constantly. I don't know if we got to that part, but. Um, so, okay, I think I wanna just zip forward a little bit. Is that okay with you? Um, and then we will close because after all, now it's nearing three o'clock in the morning for poor Dolmala, <laughs> who has withstood this exercise and remained at least visually awake. So <laughs> I'm going now to page 212. I'm turning to the final third. Um, 
So I'm on page line one, two, three, four, five lines down. Na tama mi chang yu che. At in the end, I was uh, I worked as a servant for others. Now remember, as she's encapsulating the whole story of her life, she's 23, or in our typical counting, 22. So the end of this song, of course, um, isn't actually the end of the trajectory of her life. Um, she does literally work as a servant for a while when she gets to Golok, um, but that phase transitions into becoming a master in her own right later, but she wouldn't know at the time she was 22. Um, Lezinme korwe chawar be, exerting myself in some sarak work, korme chawa, korwe chawa, um, my labor was unceasing. Le zinme. So le is also a word we have to think about all the time about how to translate. Um, you can make your text sound really differently if you choose karma here, right? Then now it sounds Sanskritic. It sounds um, lofty. It sounds dharmic. Um, so we have to think about what does she mean? Le is a good example of a word that I would consider translating differently at different times in the text. Here I said, um, my labor was unceasing, le zinme, because I think she's talking about samsaric work, the kind of work that she did out there collecting firewood, taking care of children, cooking for gyalse. Um, um, even though I um, could see that it was meaningless, right? means futile, meaningless, having no real essence. I knew this samsaric work was meaningless. I saw that. Kyang, although, um, in accordance with the advice or the prophecy of deities and lamas now i have become someone who is neither a nun nor a laywoman so again we have the use of the word nak right did sorry did someone say something no okay so Jomen Nakmen Jomo Nun Nakmen is Nakmo. Nakmo is the typical word in Eastern Tibet for wife. It literally means black woman. Again, you see the same discourse on virtue being expressed through colors. So a Nakmo is negative in that you're uh, you're zooming korwa as I and I joke about. You're busy just running around in samsara. It's like one meal to the next. You're in the kitchen and the smoke is stinging your eyes and you have no time for Dharma practice. That's all tied in to this word, Nakmo. Um, I'm, I was neither a nun nor was I an everyday laywoman. I was a religious visionary, but I didn't, um, but I didn't have monastic vows. I was in between these two statuses. Monsakwa um, nyenbe topshukki. On account of the negative influence of what I had previously done, right? There's a word that isn't here, mun sakbe le, right? This is the gesture, the expression you see everywhere about the merit you accumulated previously. Um, so from what I had done before, the negative influence of that. Ne kang du song yang dren yokre. I'm a, um, no matter where I went, I was a servant. Chur te la wang yang mingor shor. Um, although I was empowered in treasure, I lost them. And here's a question that I have that I'm still thinking about. Mingo literally means uh, a person's face. So it can refer to ownership, to being in person. Um, I'm, I'm experimenting with different ways of treating this. So she says, I lost I lost my ability to re reveal treasures, right? Although I was empowered in treasures. Me more sure. I lost them due to other people's reactions. I lost them. I lost power over them. So there, this is something I'm thinking about still, how to render that. Um, and I'm just going to blow through it so we can get 
get through this in time, but I want to highlight that as an idiomatic expression worth thinking more about. Du dendra yir kyang sakte jip. So even though the time and auspicious connections, du dendra, um, I, even though I had them, so the time and auspicious connections, meaning for revelation, were correct. Um, Sapta uh, obscured them. Sapta literally means seven in Sanskrit. And so there are two possible ways to read this. Um, it could actually be a Tibetan reference to Sapta Matrika, which is the Sanskrit, um, it's a class of um, mother deities, the seven mothers that cause obscurations and childhood illness. So inauspiciousness. Um, I asked Chatur Rinpoche directly what Sapta meant, and he said, hindrances. So that's the way that I render it, um, which kind of aligns with it possibly being taken from Sapta Matrika as well, although I haven't seen evidence of that. Um, so my evidence is from oral tradition as hindrance. So even though the time and auspicious connections were right, septa demons obstructed them or something like that. Hindrances obstructed them. Um, and here, this is another example of what, what is something like, right? Always thinking about the citational references of a text um, is interesting because you can see the metaphors that existed within Sarah Condro's mind. Um, so, like Milarepa said, and now the meter changes, which also suggests that it's a quote from somewhere else. Um, I don't desire a lover. I won't enter into a relationship with a negative lover. I'm translating Durdruk as lover. Um, enter into a relationship, Midrel, relationship, right? Um, the lotus protector's aspiration prayers are powerful. From now onwards, I don't know what will happen. So this is an interesting end. And the reason I wanted to plow through this and get to it is to gloss this in my own words. What she just said is, as Milarepa said, so she's calling upon a, a celibate renunciate as a citation. I don't want a lover. I'm not going to enter into a negative relationship with anyone. There's a but here. Um, the lotus, um, the lotus protector's aspiration prayers are powerful. What is that prophecy? So she's constantly being told through prophecy who she should be connected to and who she shouldn't. From now on, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I don't, I'm not calling the shots here. How, how my life is going to, you know, happen. I'm not sure. I don't really want a lover. It's not, it's not the path I, I want to take, but, you know, I'm paying attention to the prophecies. The end. <laughs> and so, uh, her friend, uh, she says at the end, right, my song made her cry. Um, that's it. Was that what you expected? <laughs> Hope that filled your uh, expectation. Feel free to stay in touch. I think your project is great. I would have loved to be a part of a translator training program. I just kind of winged it on my own messing up right and left and struggling through it. So uh, it's amazing that you're doing this. Sarah, thank you so, so much. That was really, really wonderful. It's so fabulous to hear anything about the life of Sarah Kundra, but especially having you explain it like that was really wonderful. Thank you so, so much. Well, thank you for coming into my world instead of me jumping all the way into the Kensei world right now so I could share this with you um, at this moment but maybe in the future we can do something more can say aligned. Still everything that you talked about was incredibly relevant for our translators so it's really great to have that kind of different tone and different style come through a text like that. 
I think that's probably the only text that they've dealt with so far that has that particular folksy style to it. So it's really great for them to have a chance to translate that. One of the things I love about Namtar more broadly, not just Sarah Condros, is that there are so many different genres embedded within Namtar, right? There's philosophical discourse and prose, and there's in, in, there's a lot of prophecy, and prophecy is usually heavily ornate and, and can involve more like kavya style ornamentation and um, metaphors. And um, so I like that we don't get to just translate one thing. There are all these different styles that are combined together and that, that keeps us alert and paying attention. So it's been fun sharing this stuff with you. Stay in touch.